Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Chris Whalen, Ira Harris, and Peter Bukvar. Chris is an investment banker, author, and chairman of Whalen Global Advisors, LLC, which focuses on financial services, mortgage finance, and technology sectors. He was a co-founder and principal of Institutional Risk Analytics from 2003 to 2013. Ira's independent trader, successful hedge fund manager, global macro consultant trading foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for over 40 years. He was also a CME director from 1997 to 2003 and also currently is a director and Peter is the Chief Investment Officer for the Bleakley Financial Group and Advisory at Bleakley. He has a newsletter product called The Book Report, B-O-O-C-K-R-E-P-O-R-T.com. It offers great macroeconomic insight and perspective with lots of updates on economic indicators. Welcome, gentlemen. Afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Great. I thought, uh, let's get started with your overall view, uh, Chris, on the credit markets and what's yeah. happening in the repo market specifically. Is this repo issue a domestic U.S. issue or more of a European development at this point or neither? It's kind of all of the above. Um, you know, the funny thing about the Fed is that the policy narrative is domestic and it's tuned for Congress. So it's basically you know, at a kindergarten level, and is meant to address the two major aspects of the, the Fed mandate, which is, you know, jobs and inflation. Um, but they kind of ignore the fact that the dollar is the world's currency, and they, you know, use it quite a lot. There's trillions and trillions of dollars worth of offshore loans uh, that are not supported by dollar deposits. So it raises a lot of interesting policy issues. And uh, but the Fed doesn't talk about this. So, yeah, it's partly the fact that there's a huge demand for dollars offshore and partly just the combination of all these new regulations and laws and the Volcker rule and everything has reduced liquidity in the system. So the numbers are really big, but the actual cash liquidity available to traders is diminished. And I think that's a that's a big problem. And Ira, your thoughts? I know you mentioned uh, in your blog about the Fed pumping half a trillion liquidity uh, for for the year end. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, the three people here on this, and you, Richard, know that full well. What's the impact going to be? I don't know. But I read Peter's piece today, and he's absolutely right. It's it's easy to to enter this, but as we've discussed many times. There's no exit strategy. They thought that, that the exit strategy was easy, okay? We, we heard it from Bernanke. It was never going to be a problem in 2010, 2011 when he was called out on it. Uh, Jan Yellen said we'd be watching paint dry. Um, Powell, Powell said it was on automatic pilot. And it's been anything but. And we have all these other issues that are uh, corollary to it. So... It's far more difficult, and as Peter, and he'll speak to it as soon as I finish uh, right here, I know he will, because it, how are, it, it's so easy to embark upon this. And that's why it's interesting watching Christine Lagarde now, because I think she truly understands what Draghi has done, because he was a, um, uh, a student of Bernanke's work, and he said, well, yeah, well, and that's all he had. You know, again, that terrible phrase from Chuck Schumer, you're the only game in town. Well, does that come back to haunt us? So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. It's easy, it's easy, as Jay Powell told me directly, to have a printing press, but to extricate uh, yourself from its effects becomes uh, more difficult. And I'll wait for Peter. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to when Bernanke first started with the, with the QEs, and he had to explain 
to the American people and to Congress what they were doing. And, and you know, he was challenged, uh, are you monetizing the debt? And he said, well, it's not really monetization if it's just a temporary thing. And here we are 10 years <laughs> later, and it's no longer a temporary thing. So when the Fed uh, started the experiment of reducing the size of their balance sheet, uh, they had no idea at what level was the right level in terms of satisfying all the counterparties and the proper level of reserves and so on. And it was, okay, we're going to do this. And I guess we'll know when we see it. We will know when something breaks. And of course, in mid-September, something broke. And, and now they're in, in panic mode. And I've spoken to some ex-central bankers and that's what they're in. They're in panic mode. And rather than having a, a thought out plan, they're just trying to throw as much money at this issue as possible to try to get them through year end without any problems. Mm. But oh. problems are beginning to grow because one of the, the, the purposes, at least of the increase in the balance sheet, putting aside the daily liquidity repo facilities, was to increase reserves again. But the, the size of their balance sheet is growing much faster than reserves. So it's sort of like there's a sieve there, and a lot of this mm. money is not ending up as a reserve. So the Fed is just winging it right now and having their fingers crossed that come January, things will calm down. But then when they try to get out, as Ira was saying, uh, well, what's the market going to do? Is it going to be able to stand on its own? And I think that remains to be seen. Well, this is the problem with setting policy on interest rates, which is if they don't do what you say they're going to do, then you have a problem. And this is from my friend Selgan. Uh, and he's absolutely right. And they also... Um, are messing with the part of the economy and specifically the non-bank sector, which actually provides jobs and employment. You know, the economists and the regulators all hate it, but that's why the U.S. recovered so nicely. So when they mess with this, there are huge, you know, implications, second, third order effects and everything else. And um, you're absolutely right. They have been winging it uh, in large part because they – they start to believe their own bullshit about reserves and everything else. And they think that that's sufficient. Um, but they don't realize that the, the real effective access to cash is, is vastly reduced. You know, so for example, none of the big banks trade their books anymore and they won't lend the securities. They won't do anything. It's totally passive. They, these are the people London whale worked with. So that whole book is dead and that's less liquidity, right? Uh, the financing, everything, gone. So, you know, they've nationalized this market. And as you say, can it stand on its own? I don't know. It's like they took a patient and they were jagging him, you know, jabbing him with drugs and everything else. And now, <laughs> now they're going to release him, right? And I, I don't think they fully appreciate that when you, you take over a market like this, um, it has, pro you know, implications for policy, I think, because, you know, you can't go any lower, as Greenspan said, uh, so, you know, here we are and, uh, every day we come in to see what's going on. The market's not that bad. I, I you know, people are looking for a crisis. I think it's okay, but, um, you know, the year end is always supposed to be a little tough, but this year is particularly odd because the big banks, Wells and Chase are just not the marginal providers of cash anymore. They just shut down. That's it. So. And how do you see this playing out in the new year, uh, Chris, in terms of w will the repo issue reignite and how will that affect central bank policies in different jurisdictions? Well, no, I think as you know, was already mentioned, it, they are going to dump uh, liquidity all over this until the problem goes away. Following, I think it was William McChesney Martin who said, lend and lend. And so, yeah, okay. But the real issue, I think, is how does the Fed resurrect a private money market, especially now that we're going to replace LIBOR with something called the secured overnight funding rate, um, and not do further violence to, you know, this market that they would tell you that they came and saved, right? Um, because the dynamism of our economy comes from the fact that we have a real bond market, and that includes the short-term funds market, and things like TBA, which are, you know, almost as big as treasuries. That's where we hedge mortgage production. So, all of these things are important, and I'm not sure they talk about it. 
So next year, you know, my hope is that as they keep monetary policy steady, um, the restoration of part of what they took back through quantitative tightening over that 18 months uh, will at least allow us to operate smoothly. Uh, and then we've, you know, got to figure out some issues. I think they have to look at Volcker and a couple pieces of Dodd-Frank and also Basel as far as liquidity rules go and try and rationalize that because until they do, we're not going to fix this. And then you have idiosyncratic problems like the offshore bid, which is not going away. Um, and also certain banks that have just stepped back like Wells, which is vast. It's trillions of dollars worth of liquidity on an off balance sheet. You know, their fiduciary business is trillions of dollars. So when, you know, they take a, a very conservative approach in their treasury and they decide to keep 15% more cash than they need, that has an effect. You know, so I, I think we have to go back to ways where the regulators are going to help us instead of hindering us, because right now we actually have less liquidity than we did before all these rules were put in place. And that's, I think, a problem. And your thoughts, Ira, going into the new year, also will the decision from the Riksbank of Sweden play into the development into the new year? Well, I, I think uh, the new year, how it plays out, uh, again, we, we it's going to be, is the Fed going to feel comfortable? I doubt it. And I don't think anybody in withdrawing this liquidity because they're, they think they can do it easier than they did on the QE one, two. That's why they're not calling the QE because of course it had some duration to it. This is all within the um, short term, uh, the T-bill market. Maybe we'll go out to the two year if they want to re reach for coupons uh, to follow Powell's logic. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but we'll see. I, I'm highly skeptical. I think Peter and Chris both have it right. It's you know they they've gone down this path now, uh, and they jump into it so easily. But they're so afraid of the markets because that's the question I keep asking. What are they so afraid of? Why won't they let markets correct and do you know uh, and try to uh, resolve this issue themselves? And of course, it goes back to Bernanke's taper tantrum when he panicked. Uh, and he should have just let the markets start to work to find out what the real effects are going to be rather than, than uh, getting nervous at the first uh, movement. Let markets work. They, they fear markets, but they don't respect markets because markets are trying to tell them things, but they won't listen because they're too fearful. Well, let's come to the Ricks Bank, which is Thursday's meeting. And they're on record, of course, as saying they're going, they've had enough of negative rates. Uh, it really hasn't uh, performed to what their anticipated expectations were. So I, they're going to go, they're at negative 25 now. I guess they're going to zero on Thursday. We'll watch it. I'd love to see them go to plus 25 to really shake everybody up. But I know uh, they're Swedes. I don't think they have it in them at this moment. Uh, it'll take a little time. But it, I think it's interesting because I think, more importantly, Christine Lagarde is watching this. I, you know, I just have the sense that, when we see Viedman, who's become very um, uh, compromising of late, which is, historically has not been his stance, but he's now, he's talking about getting rid of the Schwarz now, the uh, black zero, and that, um, and he was making the case in the, uh, in that interview in uh, Sudo, uh, Sudo Deutsche Zeitung over the weekend, that the low interest rates have benefited the sovereign in Germany 55 billion a year since rates started going down since 2007, eight. So he's basically saying they have this, this built up uh, basically uh, surplus quote unquote that they can play with. And he's actually pushing for fiscal stimulus, but I'm beginning to think that, Lagarde has willingly compromised with them because the Germans are very unhappy about the negative interest rates. In fact, so much so that they've now, the big German banks, as bad a shape as they're in, uh, are planning to, uh, to of course, charge uh, customers, client, uh, what, what do we call them, depositors, with, with deposit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Chris, you should know that when I go to the bank to make a deposit, I put up my arms. And I go, okay, you know, I surrender. Uh, what is it? So, uh, but 
So they want to charge, and, and the German <laughs> banks just do not want any part of that. So I'm beginning to think that uh, Lagarde being the political animal that she is, and I mean that in a positive sense, uh, can reach a compromise and bring rates back to zero and leave them there. And that if she can get an agreement on a massive fiscal stimulus throughout Europe. So that's why I think the Swedish uh, decision plays well for her. And that's, that's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, but you know what's so funny? Europe is hardly in the midst of a depression. And yet you have Christine Lagarde waving her arms and, you know, going on and on about the need for fiscal stimulus. And yet, you know, to the earlier comment about Bernanke, you know, his protestations about the nature of QE, it's all really about subsidizing public sector debt because none of these players want to do anything about it. You know, the Italians. Yes. Yeah. The, the UK is going to leave and the Germans are going to be very lonely because they're the only rich guy sitting at the table. You know, the yeah. French even uh, are in rather parlous straits. So, you know, I just look at this as a bank analyst and kind of laugh because none of them are, are survivable. I actually started something called the Deadpool for banks that are <laughs> particular value destroyers, you know, and we got Deutsche, of course, but we have HSBC and they don't know what to do with that. Uh, and none of these banks are unlike their American counterparts are making enough money that they can go fix their problems. That's the key thing. Well, so, to, to that point and what Ira was saying. So Ira, if, if there's an agreement, okay, that the ECB is going to take rates back to zero uh, as, as part of this plan, it's, they're going to need a bailout fund to save a lot of European banks that haul and that have all these sovereign bonds on their balance sheet that are yielding below zero, that you're going to basically evaporate eleven trillion dollars of negative yielding securities just by going back to zero. Mm. Yep. Well, yeah, yeah, but but they're pushing for that, Peter. You know, well, even you know, Oh, I, I, I'm glad that they are because I, I yeah. you know, I mean, I'm glad that they are, but I'm just saying that the, that the, the banks that hold all this paper the mark to market losses that they're going to take by just going back to zero is going to be rather extraordinary. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's, that's why Draghi, you know, it, uh, it, this has been an abomination. It, 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 everybody, you know, of course, applauds them. Yeah. You know, if you, if you have assets, you applaud them because you've, well, now even Europe is starting to do well. They were a laggard, but an effective, you know, as Chris makes and in that piece, uh, China wags the dollar. Uh, it, it's so much global in nature, and and money is fungible. We know that in a in the present world, not the world that I was educated in, because money wasn't as fungible because we had capital controls and many other things. But it's so fungible now that they know this and they keep pushing it. So, yeah, they'd have to absorb some losses, or you know, or the or as um, Jay Powell famously said when I asked him who guarantees the ECB. He didn't even blink. He didn't stutter. He said directly in, in answer to my question, they have a printing press. Yeah. Uh, it, it did not make me comfortable, by the way. It made him comfortable, but not, I was not comfortable. So that would, I think, Peter, you're, you, that's a great point, and they will have to resolve this, but they're trying to do that banking union anyway with some type of uh, European-oriented FDIC because they realize they need they need uh, they need a banking union and they need a euro bond. Maybe she gets them both. And I just want to add also swinging back to what Chris was saying about um, you know the Fed and 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 easing up on the regulatory side to sort of clear out some of the the, the clogs in the, in the pipes. Unfortunately, you know the, the Fed and other central bankers don't think like that in the sense that. They don't go directly to the disease. They just treat the symptoms. So that's why we're hearing about them creating this standing repo facility. So rather than addressing directly what caused this 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 clog, they're going to throw another um, facility out there, get them deeper into the markets, and that's going to be their answer to what's seemingly going to be their answer in addressing this. Yeah, I agree with you. Unfortunately. It's the old New Deal tendency. Let us create another arm of the GSE. Right. You know? 
and nobody yeah. can compete. Look, the Fed wants to compete with the uh, banks and payments, which is madness. Right. Uh, that's another issue everybody's got, because it's directly linked to the money markets, by the way. Um, why doesn't the Fed just fix the efficiency of the, you know, system that it already runs? No. It doesn't open on weekends. It closes early. You know, the whole thing is 40 years out of date. But instead, they're going to spend billions of dollars to go ahead and compete with banks and payments. So... You know, I, I, there's got to be some way of limiting their uh, their scope because, unfortunately, in economics, you could do whatever you want. So the I, the Fed really has no limit to its mission, if you think about it. Oh, oh no, they, it, it's a power grab each and every way, and and I think that was a great another great part of the. Uh, yes, they get to play with this, and, they, and yet they don't admit that they have, as, the, as that piece poignantly points out, they, they don't, they haven't accepted their international role, which I found amazing. Although since uh, April or May, Richard Clarida has written, every speech he gives in, in, invokes, I think what's called the third, what I would consider a third mandate, because he wants to acknowledge what the international scope of Fed policy is and, and adhere to it, but the Fed is so afraid that the people sitting in Congress would go, wait a minute, that's not your mandate, even though, of course, Bernanke showed us with the massive swap lines, although he's not the first to use swap lines, but it was oh, no. the massive amount of, right? It, he wasn't the first, but, mm -mm. but and, I, and I, from what I understand, they haven't, they haven't powered up now because they're concerned about, a, you know, what, you, what the article certainly stipulates, about a global dollar shortage, and they want to make sure that that's not one of the elements uh, pushing the repo market, but we'll see. And uh, in addition to U.S. monetary stimulus or accommodation, do you see the potential for increased fiscal stimulus, uh, Chris? In the U.S., no, nothing's going to happen. Uh, uh, no, I, I, maybe uh, in Europe, God knows because of the political problems. But I think if they go down that road in Europe, it's going to further inflame passions in Germany where they're already pissed off. And my, my prediction is that they are the next ones to leave. And then the whole experiment will you know, devolve back to a trade union. Uh, I know they're going to try and do this bank thing, but they don't have the money. So unless that agency has the power to declare sol insolvency, and they have to agree on what, insolvency means in Europe. They still haven't done that. Uh, and that agency has to have the authority to resolve a bank or do a merger, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. tough politically. We'll see. But I, I really am dubious. I don't think they have the, uh, the economic uh, substance to move forward. You know, I know that the agencies and Lagarde all want to try, but I, I'm very dubious about that. What about fiscal stimulus is not is not homogeneous. I mean, no. people throw out oh, fiscal stimulus. You, Japan's been doing fiscal stimulus for 25 years. It's all in the 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 complexion of of the fiscal stimulus. So Japan now has a new fiscal stimulus package that that's that they're putting together. But the question is, is this just going to be another round of what's failed in the past in terms of not generating anything sustainable? I mean, that's stimulus is supposed to be temporary in nature. And then you revert back to where you were. So building new roads and bridges, wow, you get some great new roads and bridges, but there's nothing self-sustaining about that. And mm. so we have to be careful when we throw out, oh, fiscal stimulus, because uh, unless it's, it's, it's long-term you know, tax cuts, for example, um, it's just a temporary steroid shot. And when you, when you rely on the government to actually implement it, uh, the multiplier effect is typically less than one. Oh, yeah. Well, the Europeans have already decided that private business is bad um, and that they can somehow manage this from on high. So, you know, unfortunately, even though the, the facts are with the business sector in Europe, the, the bureaucrats have no intention of rolling back taxes or doing anything of the, of the sort. So, you know, it's a very tough environment in Europe. And yet, there, as I said before, it's it's not like Europe's in crisis economically, but they are certainly going through a bad time in, in autos, for example, in Germany, which is um, causing some big ripples. 
but it was inevitable. You know, Euro is still fairly strong. Imagine if the Euro really reflected what's going on there as a credit. Um, I think, you know, it'd be a lot cheaper than it is. So, uh, Your thoughts, Ira, on the potential for U.S. fiscal stimulus? Uh, for f U.S. fiscal stimulus? I think uh, in this political year, not a chance because, uh, as we can see, this this Congress will not give Trump anything, and Trump won't give them anything. So I, I think we're absolutely landlocked. Uh, and that whatever opportunity that they had to, uh, to make him the preeminent builder of America, I, I think that ship has sailed. And I can look at certain stocks that tell me that point. Um, it's just not going to happen. I wish, I wish it would have happened because every time I come through LaGuardia now, uh, which took them an awful long time to do, and it's a great make-work program, but it is having a, a noticeable effect, and there's so much of that work that could go on in America. But you know, they, they've wasted they've, they've wasted treasure and time. Uh, I thought that you know, I, the Trump tax cut I thought for corporate America was a good thing and necessary. Uh, the other parts of it. Um, I, I would have made it pay for itself uh, in, in raising taxes on certain individuals or in my others, and we would have been far ahead of the game. But uh, I think they've wasted a tremendous opportunity and nothing will get done in 2020. And, and good luck finding the bodies to implement any infrastructure plan. I mean, right. construction right. crews or, or helter-skelter, um, good luck finding people to, to actually implement anything. Yeah, trust me, I'm working it's on tight construction labor market. projects. Yeah, it's it's right, and and Europe supposedly has some of that same problems too, because again, you know, everybody talks about Britain, but Britain, what was the unemployment rate today? Three point eight percent. Three point eight. Yeah, so you know, it, it it is low, and you're and the labor. So yeah, you could pass some legislation, but you're not going to get anything done. And no, and as Peter points out, nor should you. And it's and that brings to point something that Peter has discussed for a long time, the cash freight rate and how in the last unemployment data, transportation jobs were up when the, the cash index was so, has been weak for what, how long, Peter, six, seven months? Uh, ten, no, like 10 months. 10 months. So I, I, I mean, the, I, right. where, do, where do they come up with these numbers? Something doesn't, you know, it doesn't jive. And I trust the private sector data far more. Um, yeah, you could have driven a truck between the uh, BLS and the ADP number. Yeah. But, and I know that pun was intended, so I'll go with that. <laughs> exactly. So what do you, what do you make of the, the China-U.S. Uh, trade negotiations and dealing? Um, let's start with Chris. I think it's kind of going as as one might expect. the uh, The two parties are irreconcilable in a sense that the the Chinese Communist Party has a very different agenda from the United States, and they're not about to change their behavior pattern just because we impose some tariffs on them. So it's it's caused them some pain, and this is a very interesting year because Xi Jinping is trying not to send the people's army into Hong Kong to sort out the problems there. Um, and I think, you know, I, th I expected them to announce some sort of initial uh, deal, but I also think that this is not going to end anytime soon uh, because they, the Chinese just cannot fit themselves into a, you know, Canada, Mexico, U S type trade framework. And they're not going to do that. They have an explicitly, mercantilist, uh, very aggressive policy. And they're, they're trying to create their own empire. But I, I think that economically they're, they're in some, you know, they're in big trouble. They have piles of debt that no one even talks about. They have more GSE debt than we do. <laughs> so, you know, what can I say? The party uh, is only concerned with uh, continuance and short-term stability. And so that's pretty much what they do. You know, you talked to, about building things. Oh, my God. You know, China has this infrastructure that they may never use, uh, but they keep building it just to keep people busy. 
Uh, and again, that's one of the reasons why they have not been harsh in Hong Kong, because they're not sure what would happen next. You know, it's, it's a little too big. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting sign that they are smart enough not to just send the thugs in to clean out the students, because that's what they did at Tiananmen. Uh, but I think they understand that they can't do that now. So when you juxtapose the internal politics and the economy, which is hurting, uh, they have shortages of a lot of different foodstuffs, for example, uh, and that worries them in terms of stability. But then you have, you know, Trump, who I think a lot of people believe is doing something which needed to be done. Uh, it was long overdue. So, you know, I, I don't think the trade war is over by any means. Definitely not. And your thoughts, Ira, and could this have a long-term negative effect on the U.S. agricultural sector, or is it just short-term? No, well, I, you know, first I think Chris's point is, is very important because China has grown up, and it's not 1989, and the point is they're, they're involved in the world, whether they want to admit it or not, far more they were, of course, in 1989, uh, and there's all kinds of other stuff going around it. And I think the, the economic needs, and I'm not talking about the tariffs, I'm talking about what Chris was talking about, the importance of financing their huge amount of debt that, that is on the books. But that, I, I think, you know, you know, and I'm, I believe as much as you needed to engage with China on, on intellectual property rights and other issues, I always thought this administration Played it wrong because the American agricultural sector has spent 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, if we want to go back to the China lobby uh, uh, and their effect on what could have been a, a really growth in the U.S. agricultural sector, but was met with political challenges. But the American farmers have, have lost a lot of goodwill in these last year and a half. And you know, I always make fun of Wilbur Ross because here's a guy who's a uh, he's a classic vulture investor and should understand about the destruction of goodwill. And they've destroyed a lot of goodwill because they 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 embarked upon this in March of what 2018, right when the Brazilian harvest was coming in, which was a massive harvest. So the China, you gave the Chinese an alternative. You know, this is like uh, calling an airplane. You know, an air traffic controller strike in August when nobody's flying. Why would you, it's a terrible time to have done this because there was an alternative. And the Chinese played that alternative very well. So American, uh, yes, I, food is fungible and it's gonna go somewhere. But the development of the Chinese market was very important to the American ag sector. And I think this is really one of the key fallouts, negative fallouts from this whole thing. And I think it scared Trump two weeks ago when he sent out that inane tweet accusing Argentina and Brazil of intentionally depreciating their currencies in order to, you know, to uh, impact the U.S. agricultural sector. I mean, it was wrong on so many levels, but it sent a message to me, and the way I interpret it is, is that the White House was getting scared that this wasn't playing out quite the way it was designed. And I thought that, they, that Trump was beginning to panic going, well, wait a minute, I thought we were going to have this deal done. Because, as I say, this was the, uh, the phase one may as well be called the uh, Electoral College Act of 2019. Because if Trump fails to, you know, the farmers have been loyal to this point. But the, the farm sector is in terrible shape right now. They're saddled with a lot of debt. And there's a, there's a lot of uh, bankruptcy going on. So if this didn't end soon, he really, I think good to get uh, to not hold those areas. And if he can't hold those areas, he's not regaining the White House in any way, shape or form. Unless, of course, it's Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. Then, you, then of course, he will. And your thoughts, Peter, on the, this issue? In, uh, uh, US yeah, so I, I agree with Aaron. I think he, he took the legitimate issue of of China and how they've dealt with uh, their ascension on the global stage and property theft, I mean, technology theft and so on. And I think that they fought this 
in the exactly the wrong way, and that Trump took advice from Peter Navarro and Lighthizer, who's a good negotiator, but Lighthizer is a lawyer who dealt with steel companies and got George Bush to implement steel tariffs that were uh, scrapped not too long after because they realized the damage that was done. To think that tariffs that American companies pay was the proper tool in getting China to do what they wanted them to do, I think was the exact wrong way of going about it. If someone is stealing your technology, you go after the people that are stealing, the companies that are stealing, like we did with ZTE, like we did with Huawei, like we're dealing with, with, with Chinese professors that are, that, are, that are sneaking around and stealing our stuff in the U.S. We're kicking them out. You go directly at what the problem is. Instead, we, again, rightly identified the, the, what we needed to do and, and, and what the challenges were, but now we've, we've, we've destroyed, as Ira said, uh, a 40-year relationship between the American farmer and, and the Chinese. Uh, look, when you've talked to a main lobster man who's, been, uh, who's lost a customer, uh, and to think that, that, that tariffs was the answer, when in history is tariffs an answer? Uh, so now we're stuck with them. It's a, it's a total roach motel. So here we are. We barely got a phase one, and good luck getting a phase two. And instead of, as part of the phase one, laying out a path to get rid of the existing tariffs where – basically 95% of them are sticking with us, uh, it looks like the, the rest of the tariffs aren't coming off unless we get a phase two. And if we don't get a phase two, then we're stuck with these tariffs. Now, on a dollar basis, it's not extraordinary. It only comes to about $70 billion. But it's more than just the dollar amount. It's, it's the, 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 the ripple effect throughout a supply chain. It's the disruptive nature of it. And I refer to it as, as, as throwing mud into the gears of, of business activity is what tariffs are. Uh, so we've gotten into this, and he has no idea how to get out of it. And we're almost two years in, and what do we have? We're going to have promises from China that they're going to adhere to uh, and, and, and enforce IP protection. Well, we'll, we'll see, I guess. Well, it's all politics, guys. That's why he's yeah. doing this. And, you know, we'll see uh, We'll see how it works. I'm still not sure who the opposition is going to be. We'll see about that as well. Uh, final question is, going into the new year, what are the, the key economic and geopolitical risks you see and also the opportunities for investment in the, in the financial markets? Chris? Well, geopolitical risks. I don't know if there are any. We may all just get put to sleep next year um, <laughs> because everyone wants to pass the buck in the political spectrum. And the economists, too, I think, have run out of gas, despite what you know, the Europeans are talking about. Um, there's a growing body of people who think that negative rates is a waste of time. So... I'm not really that worried about the markets per se because most asset classes that we all care about are driven by scarcity right now. You know, people buying stocks for no reason. You've got, you know, the real estate market extremely overvalued uh, in comparative terms, but it's not going to go down because we just don't have supply. So there's kind of scarcity in a lot of these asset classes. Um, I don't expect the U.S. economy to really slow that much. But the, the interesting thing I'll say is that, you know, I spend a lot of my time in the mortgage industry. The asset collateral looks great. Can't lose money in, in real estate loans right now or construction loans, which is remarkable. Um, but on the other hand, the obligor, I think, is under stress. Uh, I think household debt is up and, you know, incomes are not really growing that fast, it's certainly not as fast as home prices. So people who have shoehorned themselves into these high-priced markets are probably under a fair amount of pressure. And so I'm not sure what's going on with the underlying consumer in the U.S., and I think you could see some increased um, credit costs coming out of that. Um, you know, for financials, nah, you don't want to buy them. They're expensive right now, and they're going to be under compression in terms of earnings. Um, funding costs are slowly rising and what they earn on their assets is not. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, analysis. Uh, what's hot? I don't know. I mean, it's, that's really, I think, the problem is that in financial assets, the quality of the new issue securities has been 
you know, poor, in my view, a lot of the fintech stuff I follow has not been that interesting. And, you know, the banks are fully valued. Charles Schwab, which just announced a big acquisition, is three and a half times book value. So, you know, all the financials are, are at record uh, valuations since the uh, crisis, by the way, except for people like Goldman Sachs and Citi uh, that are just barely at book value. So I don't know. I, I would um, I would look for opportunities actually in the, the credit markets right now. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm focused on really strange assets that most investors can't buy. So I'll just leave it at that. And your view, Zyra? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I see so much pain on the horizon, and I want to ask Chris: Will the demise of WeWork have a huge effect on uh, real estate assets? Because, you know, I sit with a lot of real estate guys who I respect, mm. who mm. who are quality because they actually they're like Sam Zell. They understand credit, and they they were down on WeWork because they just couldn't understand how this could possibly work. And, mm-hmm. this, and these we work as leases at top of the market valuations. This isn't mm-hmm. like buying out Kmart at six, $6 a square foot, you know, for their leases and then releasing them out. These are, these, these are premium paid leases. So mm-hmm. I, I think that's going to have huge, that my personal belief from listening to, uh, especially these guys out here in Scottsdale, uh, Peter, you've met a couple of them. Uh, they are so down on us, and they think that the fallout is going to be huge on the real estate market. So the banks may take some hits here uh, that they're not. not uh, no, I, I agree with that. What I would tell you here in New York is that we work with soaking up a lot of excess capacity. There's even more capacity that the boys, as I call the old developers, were keeping off market. In other words, you have an awful lot of commercial real estate in this town that they don't market for rent because they're desperately trying to stabilize prices. Then you look at Resi. Most of the construction has been mid to high end here in New York, expensive. And it's, it's not selling in great amounts, probably peaked in 2016. So this is a capacity overhang is the way I'd put it. And yes, some of the banks may take some hickeys. Uh, some of them went into senior debt and some of these big projects along Central Park. And I don't know. See, the, the, the supposition is that the developers can wait and that they have the funding to wait and won't have to throw these apartments out there as rentals. But we'll see. I'm very skeptical about Hudson Yards. It's not the same as downtown, for example, around the uh, Freedom Tower. That, that works because there are people there and there's a community there. But the West Side, I don't know. Even Jersey City, frankly, you know, and and there's a lot of construction here. So I I think there's a capacity problem in certain areas that are very expensive, but generally you have a lack of capacity uh, nationwide, especially single family. So we'll see, but commercial, yeah. So certain parts of the commercial universe right now that are really weak, you know, retail, uh, some of the high end office space, because uh, the demand has changed dramatically. They welcomed WeWork. They saw Masayoshi Son, and they thought that was great. <laughs> yeah. But your instinct is right. And yet, when you look at the default numbers and, you know, uh, the way bank, commercial, um, multifamily, everything else is performing, it's still really good. It's too good, actually. So maybe it's going to turn. You know, I had, and I saw yesterday that Masasan uh, has problems now in Japan because oh, yeah. they used to give them f- free reign. Now all of a sudden, the auditors are starting to show up. So, well, uh, yes, he's been bloodied, and now that his yeah, mortality oh, yeah. has been revealed, um, it may be a different thing. I, I'm, I'm concerned about it, and it will hurt bond investors. Where the risk is today is with bond investors. And they will, you know, they're victims and they will die quietly, but they will certainly <laughs> take some hickeys. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain in private equity land too, boy. I can't tell you how many stupid deals I've seen. And the, well, the value yeah. destruction is monumental. Well, yeah. And yeah, I've always, I've laughed for 20 years just because there's more money chasing deals 
doesn't make them better deals. No. I mean, it is for somebody, but no, they get worse with more all, money. Yeah, yeah, there's only so many good ideas out there on any given day. You're not uh, flush. Flush capital does not create good ideas except for the sellers. Yeah, let me tell you what's going on. The, the better quality junk issuers, some of whom are fine, but they just priced as junk, are doing really well. And then the other portion, which is not so nice, and, and you know downright rancid in some cases, is trading very poorly. And I think you're going to continue to see that that disparity increase. Um, you know, because there was so much issuance out there that really was junk, but it somehow or another it got the triple B, and then it's going to reprice. You know, we've seen this movie before, guys. We're old enough for that. Yeah, well, that's for sure. And uh, finally, your thoughts, Peter, going into the new year. So I, I always I look at where where the the excesses are, and it's. We, to what we talked about earlier about if the ECB tries to go back to zero rates, I mean, the, the, the global bond market is the biggest financial bubble in the history of, of, of financial markets, and negative rates is, is the epitome of it because it's the epitome hot potato. So if we got any further shift after the Ricks Bank in trying to get out of negative interest rates, uh, I, I cringe at the ripple effects uh, past just sovereign bonds, but where it goes throughout global fixed income markets. And if you're going to drain the air and, and pop that bubble, uh, that's my biggest concern. Yeah, you could definitely have some interesting things happening in Europe uh, with banks. You know, Because we're on this bond bubble together. I mean, you even have the Bank of Japan that mm -hmm. wants a steeper yield curve. 25 years plus of trying to suppress interest rates, and now even the Bank of Japan wants higher long-term interest rates. And you had a revolt within the ECB after what Draghi did back in September. So you've seen pretty much the end of easing in Europe. So this is the setup for higher rates. All you need is something to trigger it. Uh, and, and we'll see whether um, we, we get any of that in 2020, whether it's a better economy that triggers it, whether it's getting out of zero interest rates because they realize what they've done to their banking sector. Maybe it's a bout of inflation that, that comes out of left field. Who knows? But to me, that's my biggest worry is if, if uh, central banks lose control of the global bond market. Oh, yeah. That's a, it's a very good point. And, you know, we go back to the Basel, which I, I've always found preposterous with that zero risk weighting for sovereign debt, all sovereign debt. Come on. Well, well, that's Let's the story of the post-war age. You know, when, when we went into World War II, the confidence in policy and the ability of anybody to set direction economically was zero. And the government bailed us out, and big banks, of course, and big companies. Uh, and that's all you had for 30 years after World War II until the 70s. The 70s were the big non-bank renaissance when, you know, broker-dealers and non-bank finance companies came back into vogue and, and the U.S. bond market thrived. And that's why we've been able to do so well. But you don't have that in Europe. You don't have that in Japan. So, you know, I worry about that, which is that this whole cycle may now be kind of at the end. And uh, we could see a good bit of contraction among financials. we got to have consolidation. But, you know, it, I, I have a whole list of banks that need to be merged with somebody. I just don't have anywhere to put them. <laughs> does you... Does UBS consolidate with Deutsche Bank to make like a giant uh, European like, entity? Uh, that could be. I mean, UBS isn't doing that great, but they're okay compared to yeah. Deutsche. You know, look at Namura. There's another weak business. Oh, um, God, yeah. Uh, City. City, uh, you know, in theory, you could slam City and HSBC together because they both have a consumer book. But, you know, the complexity of that would be mind boggling. Um, so that's the thing, you know, the, the Fed created a lot of big monstrosities and the Europeans too. And then they want to do a, you know, a banking regime and deposit insurance. That's quite ambitious for uh, people who've tolerated this level of mediocrity. What we need to do, of course, is loosen up the ownership restrictions and then we'll fix it real fast. Because, you know, Google <laughs> or Apple would buy yeah. City yeah. and keep the consumer book and keep the payments platform and get rid of everything else. And they'd end up with a trust company, you know, that's Facebook solution, by the way, non-bank trust company, Fed member, 
master account, all the stuff you need, FDIC insurance. And that would satisfy everyone's concern. You could do it tomorrow. Okay, a great insight, gentlemen. How can our listeners learn more about your work, Chris? Uh, well, I'm, I'm an investment banker. I uh, write the Institutional Risk Analyst, and I write for a couple other publications, but that's where you find me. And Ira? Uh, same place, Notes from Underground. I blog, um, and I'm wherever I appear, I, with FRA, and uh, I, you know, usually I find a spot with Santelli and somebody else. Uh, who, so that's where, and I'm, I also visit this room called White Wave, because it's a trading room dedicated to traders, you know, who don't have a long-term investment horizon like Chris may have at times, but he's, he understands the trade. So there's a lot of good work going on there because it's a lot of give and take uh, and a lot of pushing and kicking the tires as I speak. So you can uh, reach, uh, find me there two or three times a week. Great. And Peter. Uh, so you can read my, my daily uh, macro writings at the bookreport.com uh, or if you're interested in money management slash wealth management uh, services uh, at Bleakly Financial Group. Great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll do it again sometime. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 